So it's time to start, I guess. Thank you for coming all. This is my updated um, abstract. Mainly, you know, this um, now has reached every uh, corner of China and uh, the uh, continents, although I, I haven't come across anything uh, specifically indicating that South America uh, has had cases, but it's, uh, if not, then it's just a short matter of time, I'm sure, because they're involved in international travel as much as any other uh, region of the globe. Um, but at this point, we have 9,700 and 213 deaths. That was as of about uh, 15 hours ago. Um, the WHO declared this uh, a an international health emergency, which I think is appropriate. Yeah, you know, North North um, America is certainly involved. Um, This is a slide I made just for fun. I used an image of a MERS virus. But uh, in the collective consciousness, it's uh, uh, the idea of viruses is pretty scary. It even uh, ends up in lyrics of music. Um, the reason this virus that came out of Wuhan, China, uh, is called 2019 NCOV is because it was 2019. Really, uh, probably the index case or first case occurred in late November. Um, and um, uh, it was um, December before they realized they had something going on. And so as 2019 was the year it started, um, uh, Yes, I am going to talk about that in a bit, uh, Dave. Um, and N stands for new or novel. Uh, that's It's not unique. The usage of the modifier N um, is not unique to this particular virus. It's used with other coronaviruses as well. And of course, COV refers to coronavirus. So that's the, um, that's the basis of the name. The name's pretty simple. And, uh, want to find information about it, um, you could always write Wuhan coronavirus, but if you do a search for 2019 NCOV, um, then you will get a lot of stuff. I like this slide and I uh, have used it in the past uh, um, because it uh, goes over the traditional phylogeny, but uh, um, a point I want to make is uh, they, have traditionally applied this genus, species, family, order, and so forth, uh, as well as they can to viruses. I don't think viruses are alive, but um, uh, genus and species give uh, a familiar handle, almost humanized the virus. If you can put a name on something, you can get your head around it or get a sense that you have um, uh, a handle. Well, they reproduce by uh, taking over the machinery of uh, other living things. Um, uh, they're not standalone. And I, I think of viruses, I made this analogy earlier, as sometime in the future we'll have a lot of autonomous vehicles. Imagine if some of them get hacked or subverted or someone inserts um, messes with the code. Someone uh, wants to hop up their autonomous vehicle. And so it um, makes mistakes uh, because it's not doing what it was intended to do. And uh, people start getting hit on the street by um, uh, autonomously driven trucks and things. Uh, that's sort of like catching a virus. These things are little machines. They're biological machines. I don't think of them as alive, but at any rate, 
1993, I really liked virology and I, I wanted to pursue it. Um, and uh, I would have loved to have converted myself into a professional virologist um, that I didn't have the uh, resources and choice to just go off and do something I wanted to do. Uh, so I just remained a faculty member <laughs> in, in a medical school. Um, but I wrote a book chapter in 1993 on uh, respiratory viruses. And uh, there's um, an easier to read um, bit here. I used this slide back when I uh, talked about um, uh, type 1 double-stranded DNA viruses like uh, human papillomavirus or HPV. Um, this is the David Baltimore classification of viruses. It goes back to 1971. That's when he's, he's a really dif uh, distinguished, uh, brilliant guy. Um, but um, it only makes sense to classify these things based on their genetic machinery. And because um, that's what determines how they behave. And uh, the genetic machinery is really pretty distinct and amazing. Uh, amazingly intricate, uh, even for these little uh, little strands. Uh, there are five cold viruses, common cold viruses. And that's uh, one of the things I covered in my book chapter back when. Um, uh, the most common is probably the rhinovirus, and there were like 17. I don't know. Now, those are type 4 viruses with single-strand RNA virus. Type four. There's one type of virus for every day of the week, and so um, you can think of the cold viruses uh, are, sub are spread over these. Uh, two of them are in type four. I put the s four snowflakes in yellow there to emphasize. I want you to grab onto type four and think of positive single-strand RNA, meaning that the RNA in this virus acts just like messenger RNA. Um, we're uh, starting to get in uh, what is life uh, kind of discussion here, I guess, but uh, one could debate all that, but uh, I better stay focused for the moment. Um, the uh, adenovirus can cause colds. It's a double-stranded uh, DNA virus. It tends to be a nastier kind of cold and uh, whereas in young adults, uh, often military uh, training camps will have an outbreak of those and that kind of thing. That's where it uh, comes up uh, and, um, and has been studied. Um, also, influenza and parainfluenza are type five viruses, um, antisense negative strand RNA. Uh, single strand RNA. Um, four and five are both single strand. Four is plus. Uh, five is an odd number. Think of that as negative, maybe. Um, uh, and so uh, these cold viruses don't have to have any. Uh, they, like I say, they're in all these different groups uh, that are disparate. Um, I have uh, hantavirus there, which is. Uh, a type five virus that's uh, a zoonosis uh, and a zoonotic uh, organ uh, organism, if you want to call it, or organ uh, infectious agent. Um, and I mentioned that later in the talk. But the uh, coronavirus is the one I want to focus on today and particularly uh, say what we might be able to know about this um, uh, likely epidemic we're dealing with. So if you can remember David Baltimore and seven types of viruses, and this coronavirus is a type four. And uh, these RNA viruses, generally, they operate in the cytoplasm. And so they're kind of in the underground economy. Uh, they're not dependent on this uh, um, M phase with mitosis and uh, uh, what the nucleus is doing for their uh, uh, business. And so that's the reason why I put this slide in. Uh, 
I'm going to stop and just talk with this slide uh, present. This is a MERS virus. Um, I'm going to introduce these things and talk in more detail uh, over time. Um, but um, this uh, one thing about this virus is you can see why it's called a coronavirus. It's an electron micrograph. Uh, it's about 125 um, uh, nanometers in, in size and diameter. And uh, there are spikes that stick off of it. These are enveloped viruses. Um, and these spikes, there uh, are four structural proteins to this. It's, uh, and I, I um, suggested for previous group, um, if you want to know about this, um, use this acronym MENS with a small e because the e uh, envelope protein is of less abundance. The um, M is the uh, membrane uh, protein and the N is the nuclear, uh, nucleocapsid protein and the S is the uh, spike protein. We are all going to die at some point, but not today, I hope. Um, at any rate, um, the uh, S spikes are um, really quite interesting and they uh, define the affinity for the host cell. In the SARS virus, and I don't know about the MERS if this is true for that, uh, I don't know exactly what the receptor is, but in the SARS virus, which is the one that uh, uh, started in uh, Jordan and was in Saudi Arabia um, around 2012. Um, I, I'm sorry, 2002. I'm, miss, I'm messing this up. Uh, SARS virus was from China in 2002. Um, and what I want to say is that the SARS, I am, I'm talking extemporaneously here and just from my slide. Um, it its uh, receptor is the angiotensin type 2 receptor. Now, uh, uh, that is a um, uh, part of a system that the body uses to make the blood pressure go up. In fact, there's, there are uh, antihypertensives that are angiotensin inhibitors. Um, uh, but this, uh, the knock on the door for the uh, is through this S protein spike that you see sticking out of the corona of this coronavirus, and it uh, goes to wherever there are ACE type two or angiotensin two receptors in terms of the SARS at least. Um, again, I'm not sure what the receptors are for MERS. I certainly don't know a new one. Um, I want to point out that up to 2002, coronaviruses for humans were considered pretty benign. They were just thought of as cold viruses that caused mild respiratory infections. Now, they were a problem for livestock and pets and wild animals. They could kill them. Um, they could cause encephalitis in pigs and uh, uh, flu-like symptoms in camels and all kinds of things. But uh, generally, uh, they were sp species-specific. Um, trouble is that these viruses reproduce at such a rate and they can undergo a little mutation here and there and uh, find a uh, uh, receptive host um, that's uh, transspecies. Um, so this, this virus uh, has uh, one, one long strand of RNA, one single strand of RNA, uh, it's not a double strand, and it's got about 30,000 uh, bases, 30,000 nucleotides on it, and of uh, uh, ribo uh, uh, nucleic acid, DNA has deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, that codes for about 16 non-structural genes and or non-structural proteins and four structural proteins and a lot of the non-structural proteins have multifunction. It's really a, a fascinating mechanism how it takes over. I liken this thing to a thug that comes to your door 
and um, weasels their way in and this comes to the door and knocks on it at the um, let's say that in this case of MERS uh, of the SARS anyway the ACE inhibit the ACE um, receptor ACE type 2 receptor and it merges with the uh, cell membrane it's got an envelope and uh, there's debate about it, but in that process, it uh, uh, releases or um, uh, injects its uh, um, uh, uh, single-strand um, positive sense RNA uh, genome into the cytoplasm. And so like a thug that you happen to mistakenly or using bad judgment let into the into the um, uh, no, RNA can be double-stranded. Um, anyway, uh, you happen to let this thug into the into your house, get in the locked door, where the you know the screening takes place, and then they take off their their capsule or their jacket, and you see what a thug. They look around and they think I. I think I like it here. And um, they have uh, uh, immediate access. They, they tend to associate with the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. They have immediate uh, interaction with um, your own ribosomes. And because it's a positive sense RNA, it'll produce um, uh, 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 protein products. It produces a number of protein products that um, are generally referred to as non-structural proteins that will symbol in a complex as multifunction. Uh, one of the functions is to replicate the um, uh, original RNA and to make a negative strand. And um, um, then, uh, so it does that. Um, and there is some an, an evidence it tends to block your own um, messenger RNA transcription or translation. Uh, so it has an uh, it's it makes a some negative strands, and then it does two things: it will do readings of um, parts of that and create positive strand uh, RNA. Uh, um, pieces that are subgenomic, meaning less, not the whole 30,000 um, uh, uh, base uh, uh, polymer, but uh, pieces of it um, that uh, go on to be read by the ribosomal machinery and produce proteins, structural proteins and others uh, for the cell to have uh, and uh, um, it will also act as a replicase uh, to uh, in reverse to re reproduce the whole genome. So it's um, it gets involved uh, through the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi process, and uh, these um, the uh, uh, M protein or membrane protein uh, tends to be the dominant or most important. The E protein or envelope protein is of less abundance, but uh, M protein by itself will not let it, if you create those and put them together, you won't get self-assembly to make viral-like particles or VLPs, which is how you can make vaccines. And that's how the um, HPV vaccine was made. Uh, for different um, uh, types of uh, HPV. Uh, in this case, you'd have to have at least the uh, M and the E protein, and the nucleocapsid protein uh, is even, even better, but that's what is um, uh, intimately around the uh, uh, genome, apparently. And uh, it gets packaged there in the Golgi process, and the S spike gets added. <coughs> Excuse me. If there are extra S spikes, well, it gets then released and can spread to other cells. Now, if there are extra S spikes, the S spike can get in your own cell's membrane and attract it to other 
um, susceptible cells that often are already infected and they fuse and you can end up with multi-nucleated cells that have virus swarming through both. So they increase their, um, their space, uh, they increase their neighborhood without getting exposure to the immune system. This thing is really a thug. This is a street smart, uh, under the economy thug that uh, takes over and uh, does what it wants and it uses you. And it looks at the nucleus there, it doesn't need it and it regards it like deep state. Once it gets in there and it's taken over, it's like you can't impeach it because your immune system can't get to it. So, you, you know, it's, it's a situation you got. It's almost like biological politics. So anyway, I'm just making metaphors. Um, I wanted to give some uh, uh, definitions. Before I leave that whole idea, I, I just want to say you could make a career studying and researching coronaviruses if you're interested in your right place in your life and that would work. It is absolutely fascinating. It's going to be important um, and it'll have its uh, surges like now uh, over time, but uh, uh, it's it's a kind of marvelous little machine uh, in terms of its intricacy. Now, acute um, uh, respiratory distress syndrome, uh, that's a, a serious situation, and that's a common outcome of a lot of things, sepsis, chest trauma. I, I mentioned earlier, uh, blood transfusion reactions are so unusual, people often don't think of them when they see them. Um, I've seen a few over my career. They weren't horrible or severe, but they were, uh, they happened. Um, uh, but blood bank and blood typing and that sort of thing is so carefully done and it's pretty well understood these days. Um, Aspiration of acid from the stomach is very noxious to the pulmonary uh, epithelium down in the uh, uh, air sacs. And uh, anything that causes inflammation, uh, termed pneumonitis, uh, anything that causes inflammation can make the little uh, walls of the alveoli uh, get inflamed, infiltrated with uh, inflammatory cells and st stiffen. So it's they lose their elasticity and uh, also have inflammatory effects in the smaller airways and um, um, they fill with fluid. And when they fill with fluid, that's the hallmark of, um, of um, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. I'll show you some x-rays after a bit, but I it's an important, uh, situation. I wanted you to know about it. Its symptoms would be difficult rapid breathing, dyspnea, and uh, hypoxia, levels of oxygen in the blood. Because your ability to exchange gases, uh, get rid of carbon dioxide and absorb oxygen uh, is impaired if you don't have the surface area. If you have fluid filled spaces there, you're not going to get oxygen exchange um, or gas exchange. There's a lot of information on this slide. And again, I put, I just, I don't know, I get people saying these slides are too busy, but I figure when people, if they are interested enough, go back and look at the PDF, there'll be more for them to think about. Um, but ARDS is by no means uh, rare. Uh, I dealt with it, uh, I did general surgery uh, as a significant part of my training. Um, and I dealt with trauma and, um, and well, uh, as a surgeon type person, uh, that was the most common etiology I dealt with. Uh, infections, you would have uh, uh, medical people. Uh, uh, I, I won't use the uh, uh, slang term fleas, <laughs> except to mention it exists, uh, but they deal with um, those sorts of things, but at any rate, uh, uh, it's pretty horrible, and you see young people die from it. Um, most of the cases, when they come in, they're moderate to severe, 
that's because as soon as this starts happening, you start to get this kind of a process of inflammation and uh, a, a status that will uh, lead to fluid um, uh, filling in the air spaces in the lung, uh, which again is the hallmark, uh, it goes quickly and it goes downhill. So most of the people that come in with mild, you don't send them home and uh, you know just say take a steroid or something. You have to watch them because uh, they have a really good chance of going very quickly to moderate to severe. And uh, I also mentioned this morning of uh, like young people, somebody 22, who has a flu, a bad cough, and feels terrible, tries to drive home uh, a few hours drive or something. They get home, they're worn out, go to bed, and they die from ARDS. Um, the overall pool of mortality is 43%. You can, the mortalities for mild, moderate, and severe disease are down at the bottom. And uh, you notice 45% for severe disease. So um, the fact that the pooled overall mortality is 43% tells you how, how often uh, uh, people just stay at mild or even moderate levels. This thing tends to worsen. And you basically have to correct whatever's causing it if you can. And um, give supportive care, which means intubation and ventilator and everything else that uh, to uh, improve uh, oxygenation. Uh, okay, um, here's the viruses that we're going to talk about. The SARS came first, then MERS, and then uh, in tw uh, 2012, and then um, we've got this 2019 and CoV. Um, they're all very similar, I think, uh, in terms of what they do once they get in the door. Uh, they do what thugs do. <laughs> they take you apart. Uh, and one of the main things that happened is ARDS. Uh, that's one of the main causes of death from these kinds of viruses. And these, in contrast to the traditional coronaviruses, have increased specificity for respiratory epidemics. Now, the um, angiotensin II receptors, they're located in kidneys, gut, lungs, brain. I mean, they're all over the place. So, um, uh, reason why the lung gets wiped out and makes such a big impact is because it's a uh, high priority vital organ and uh, that's where the virus gets inhaled and that's what it has primary access to. Um, so it's spread by contact, people coughing, uh, spreading uh, aerosol um, of uh, respiratory droplets that tend to dry same sort of thing happens with tuberculosis. Uh, uh, the droplets will um, quickly decrease in diameter and um, they stay in the air for a while. Now, if you're in a place with ultraviolet light, like for, used to say, and I don't know if this is absolutely true, but uh, used to say eight seconds of um, ultraviolet light from sunlight, open sunlight will kill tuberculosis. Um, generally, anything with DNA doesn't do well in. Uh, Light. But uh, so open air, fresh air, and uh, such is probably a good idea if you want to stay healthy. Um, what occurs to me, and I don't have any proof, I, I, I noticed one time uh, right at, uh, as a light changed uh, from, uh, it was a red light, and I was in the car behind this guy, and he rolls down his window and he had a cigar, as I could tell. Um, a big puff of uh, cigar smoke out. I had my windows shut and he drove off and I drove and after just a matter of a few seconds I was smelling cigar smoke like it had been blown in my face. And what occurred to me is if somebody's coughing out or if there's an aerosol or of any sort of chemicals or infectious agents even out on the road you can end up breathing it. Um, and um, 
you can have ex, um, uh, exposure to it pretty quickly. So uh, uh, just a, a statement about how hard it is to, you, know, you got to breathe. Uh, contact uh, is easier to avoid. Don't shake hands. Uh, bump elbows or just, you know, say, uh, hi there. <laughs> uh, hi there, I'm a Virgo or something, whatever you want to do. Um, MERS, uh, by the way, is uh, in camels and uh, um, the SARS came from civet cats, uh, a um, asked palm civets uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, they look like this. And I don't think I'd try to pet it. I think you'd lose a finger or two. Um, but they're omnivores, and uh, I expect they ate uh, bats when they can get them. Uh, for this current virus, uh, the corona, the um, 2019 NCOV coronavirus, <clears throat> it's been sequenced. It was sequenced in China pretty quickly. <clears throat> and uh, then there's a lot of analysis that can be done. And there's some um, areas in the sequence where uh, it looked like it might have relatedness to snake coronaviruses. And that's possible because um, <clears throat> um, the um, uh, this new virus is it's 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 from bats. All these uh, really highly dangerous uh, coronaviruses, these beta coronaviruses, are originally from bats. It's a, a zoonotic infection, but um, it may have passed through snakes because uh, snakes will eat bats. I would root for the bat. I like bats. Um, so, okay, there's a point here that uh, humans may have acquired the SARS first from butchering food preparation with blood and organs, um, but it, it's clear, uh, very quickly clear that these become a person-to-person -person transmission uh, as a mode of, uh, of um, uh, spread uh, and uh, again for respiratory secretions but uh, people cough and shake hands and uh, you put your hands on your face I mentioned this morning if you rub your eyes with your fingers unwashed um, you're maybe inoculating yourself because your tears um, which are being secreted by basal secretors in your lacrimal gland and sweep across the cornea to keep it from drying. And then they go in the medial aspect, there's two puncti and openings and they drain these little canaliculi to a nasal lacrimal duct to the nasal cavity down the throat. And uh, ever notice when someone's about to cry and right before they do, they might go and they kind of snort because they're getting an overflow of uh, fluid coming through the nasal lacrimal ducts, and then all of a sudden they get epiphoresis or overflow of their tears. At any rate, the eyes are a good way to get um, infected. Uh, so touching your face with your hands unwashed is not a good idea, actually. All right, this is the origin originally of the beta coronavirus that led to SARS. Um, this little guy is, he's just a, a bad, is uh, found out through, throughout Southeast Asia. And um, even up in, uh, uh, along the border with India too, in places and um, the map of distribution looked like it had uh, uh, wasn't continuous, but at any rate, um, it's a Chinese horseshoe bat. And they can take a lot of specimens and, uh, you know, map them and organize them by similarity. It's called molecular phylogenics. I talked about Carl Wars, 
uh, from University of Illinois in uh, Urbana, um, who uh, uh, used that kind of technique to analyze uh, uh, bacterial ribosomal RNA and uh, found uh, that uh, there really are three domains of life. There are prokaryotes like bacteria and eukaryotic cells that have nuclei. And then there's a more uh, primitive perhaps uh, type of uh, organism called, uh, which is a, a different domain, uh, archaea um, organisms. Um, and um, uh, at any rate, that he, he was sort of the godfather of this uh, technique and others helped develop it, David Baltimore, others, molecular phylogenics, and you can use it to find uh, um, the genealogy of an infection. See its family tree, and you see SARS there. Uh, it's right there with a uh, bat. Um, 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 types of um, viruses. Um, it's nested. So um, okay, so what does SARS do? Uh, I'm going to talk about this because I think it's this is a model for what you're going to see with uh, the coronavirus uh, out of Wuhan. Um, it can cause liver damage. That's usually not too severe. Um, and, but it does seem that there may be a direct viral impact on damage to the liver from the virus, rather than it just being a secondary effect from multiple organ failure. Um, cardiovascular complications are seem to me to be mostly secondary, secondary to physiologic collapse. Um, shock, uh, hypoxia, uh, stress, and uh, uh, someone that's at all vulnerable, like uh, someone older has a previous uh, heart disease. The bigger one, though, is um, uh, uh, kidney failure. Um, it's not uh, it's not uh, real common, but it's, uh, they say it's uncommon. I don't know if I would say 6.7% is uncommon. It's close, but uh, it's, that's pretty significant to my thinking, uh, especially in the fact that uh, the, uh, um, acute renal failure is associated with a higher mortality. Um, in fact, this was something, something you would, um, uh, um, let's see, I'll, I'll address that question in a second, but uh, if, if you ever are in an intensive care unit setting, uh, managing patients, um, if a patient's slipping away, uh, it's, you can look for uh, multiple system failure. Uh, of course, you usually can recognize that in real time because you monitor them so closely. You know if the liver's failing or if the kidneys are failing along with the heart or lungs or... Um, they have a melting away. It's a domino effect. You start to get multiple system failure, your prognosis gets worse and worse. Uh, question was, how do bats transmit these diseases? It's contact. They're, they're droppings. They shed the virus if somebody eats them. Um, if um, And then somebody eats that animal, like the civet cat uh, probably ate bats. Uh, when they could find them, they, they uh, you know probably just scavenging around. And like I said, they were omnivores. They'll eat fruit as well, but uh, um, uh, so uh, the um, important point here is if you get renal failure in this, it's worse. Uh, it's a worse uh, prognostic uh, indicator. Um, acute tubular necrosis is. Uh, the, the thing I want you to remember, remember uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome because the uh, respiratory damage you get from these coronaviruses is basically in that model. It's not, it's not greatly different. It has the same physiologic effects or pathological effects. And 
if you get damage to the kidneys, uh, it usually is acute tubular necrosis, not involving the glomeruli. Uh, the glomerular uh, structures are out in the uh, cortex. I'm going to show you a picture of the kidney in a bit, uh, a bit having a cortex and a medulla, um, sort of like a mantle and core, and the crust. Um, the crust is like the, can the capsule, I suppose. Uh, the outer layers have these glomerular filtration units that where the blood will force fluid through a little membrane and down into these collection tubules and it percolates down into the medulla and back up and uh, uh, descending or efferent and afferent uh, um, uh, tubules and then and, th and there's convoluted parts of them and uh, those are uh, ducts of Henle called and then they eventually drain into the ureter um, and to the bladder, and that's um, have filtration and then have abs uh, resorption, uh, secretion, and excretion, um, and it's all um, a lot of that's um, uh, filtration's not so much energy dependent, um, except that um, you're forcing blood, you're working to get your blood flow there uh, to the kidney, but uh, the rest of it's all energy dependent. Down in the medulla of the kidney, it's high metabolic activity going on because you're having a lot of vital work done to remove toxins um, from the bloodstream and excrete them or to retrieve um, amino acids or um, uh, glucose or uh, salt or uh, water gets dragged along with these when you have active uh, resorption of salt, for instance in the kidney so that you don't end up hypotensive um, uh, makes it so you don't have to live in the ocean uh, and uh, um, so even if you do you probably need some way of uh, cleaning uh, if you're a mammal cleaning your uh, bloodstream uh, but the uh, um, hypoxic effects and probably hypotension can play in this, uh, results in lower perfusion of the kidneys, uh, lower blood flow. And if that's severe and lasts for at least 30 minutes, uh, your kidneys may shut down. Uh, you put in a catheter and you'll get what's called bladder sweat. It, it, you won't have urine output. That's a pretty serious thing. These days, uh, you, in an intensive care unit uh, setting, uh, you can, uh, uh, go to various forms of dialysis on an emergency basis. Um, but um, if you have uh, kidney failure, by the way, if you got previously existing liver disease or uh, diabetic uh, nephropathy, meaning that your kidneys have been damaged by long-term diabetes, usually it's long-term, um, so the kidneys aren't so healthy to begin with, you have a little more chance of developing a tubular necrosis in these uh, infections. And um, the mortality of acute tubular necrosis uh, uh, is like varies from 50 to 70 percent, depending on the study you look at. But it's up to, if you got acute respiratory distress syndrome on top of that, then about 80 percent of those people just die, no matter what you do. Um, and they can be of any age. I've seen too many young people in bad situations. So this is a pretty serious disease if it uh, gets out of hand. <clears throat> and one last thing, ATN in general, it's a it's a it's a kind of a common thing um, it, it, that can happen as a result of a, a type of insult. Uh, it can be ischemic or toxic insult. Um, like nephrotoxic drugs, like gentamicin can, uh, enoglycosides like gentamicin can cause uh, um, uh, tubular necrosis uh, type effects. And this is just for the next slide. I like this word, clade, rhymes with blade. Um, it's, um, I don't know if you recall, uh, if you heard my talk on um, um, human papillomavirus, and I was talking about the archaea bacteria 
um, that uh, Carl Wars um, defined as a, a third domain of uh, living organisms, but um, they have people who are looking for LUCA, L-U-C-A, the, uh, uh, the last uh, common, uh, um, uh, last universal common ancestor. Um, so um, that's looking for the ultimate clade, uh, kind of the trunk of life. This is a clade is generally like a single branch of life. Okay, you know, you can apply that technique of um, uh, molecular phylogenic uh, study uh, to uh, MERS and uh, you'll get this sort of a pattern where you can define it. I'm gonna use the term loosely genealogy or um, an origin of the uh, human infection from uh, bat uh, type viruses. And uh, that is the best uh, smoking gun evidence uh, that you can have of uh, just about of, uh, uh, of its source. Now, in terms of camels, there were, I mean, there was one case in uh, um, I think Saudi Arabia where a man uh, got MERS from his cat. He was like putting a salve on the nostrils of the uh, camel had a cold and uh, it was MERS and he got MERS and they did, it was a identical virus. So he got it directly from messing with the camel and having contact with the secretions of the camel. You know, camels tend to spit on you anyway. Uh, they have no respect. Uh, so let's see. I'll keep going here. I guess I got time. I I, I wanted to share. I, I saw this picture and this uh, this reminded me of something. Uh, you can have camel flu. The, these these animals. Uh, um, these are dromedary camels. At that camel up in the right, it reminds me of this story. Um, uh, there was this, uh, uh, this camel looks like he's saying, I, I don't know and I don't give a damn. You know, this is kind of a defiant, careless look about him. Uh, this kid was just trouble in school. And um, so the principal calls in the father and uh, uh, he says, you know, your son, he's just, he's just disruptive and he won't do anything we ask. And he's, you know, it's a lot of problem. And he says like, what do you mean? He says, well, everything he says, he, he, he answers, a, um, in an insulting way. And he says, for instance, he turns to the boy and he says, Johnny, who signed the declaration of independence? And Johnny looks at him with that same camel look there. He says, I don't know. And I don't give a damn. And his father turns to him, he says, well, if you sign the damn thing, son, just say so. So that's my joke. That's the one joke I'll tell for this whole thing. Anyway, camel urine, yeah, there are people in uh, um, um, the Middle East who um, use camel urine for medicinal purposes, apparently. Um, so the WHO, actually, uh, World Health Organization actually recommended avoid drinking camel urine because they can shed viruses <laughs> through that. Um, there are lots of dietary practices around the world which are not wise. A friend of mine shared a um, sort of disgusting video of an Asian man who was identified as Chinese uh, I had no way of really ascertaining origin uh, or location or anything of this video, but he was living, he was eating live, it looked like baby rats with chopsticks and showing them, they were wiggling and stuff, and he put them in his mouth and chew them up, and he opened his mouth and showed that he was chewing them up like it was something to be proud of. Um, that's a bad idea. Uh, I was telling people earlier, and I'll say to you all, don't eat bush meat, don't eat roadkill. And 
in fact, with roadkill, you know, they're talking about camel urine and, you know, um, I can imagine Americans laughing at that and making derisive comments. But in Tennessee, which is a, um, a, a very red state, uh, pretty redneck state, actually know Tennessee really well. Uh, and um, uh, in 1999, uh, they passed a law that people could collect and um, um, eat roadkill. And, and I figured that was um, uh, just uh, to show how redneck they were and that uh, trying to be like Davy Crockett and uh, bragging their buck knife was longer than anybody else's buck knife and that kind of stupid stuff. Uh, it's all a bad deal, uh, idea. And uh, I saw eating squirrel brains, it, it just seems uh, another horrible idea that's um, eating neurological tissue is a great way to get a prion disease like uh, spongiform encephalopathy or um, Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease. Um, so, okay, continuing on. Oh boy, an equation. It's actually not a difficult equation. Uh, this is an important number. It's called R naught. R naught it refers to um, basically how infective something is. Uh, how many people are going to end up infected by a um, uh, 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 an infectious agent? The trouble is it averages things and it looks at a population and you can have what are, I, I couldn't think of the title of it, uh, I remember it now, um, maybe my second cup of coffee helped. Um, super spreaders, you can have um, nine people who don't spread it to, uh, a disease to anyone else, even though they have it, and one person that spreads it to 20 people. And so then you could think that the, um, um, uh, trans, uh, transmissibility would um, be uh, involve um, one person uh, for every one person you'd have two people getting infected um, and it would be um, uh, skewed so sometimes these numbers come out and as you get bigger populations or uh, it uh, something that doesn't reflect a um, uh, an extreme like from calculus of variations uh, something more averaged out, a better sample maybe is a way to say it, uh, you get better numbers. But you look at this, uh, infection per contact, that's the transmissibility, the likelihood that a contact will result in infection. And then you have to look at how long the time is of contact and on average, and uh, how long the person's infected, how long they're, and, Generally for these, it's 14 days. Uh, about 170 people were just brought back by, from Wuhan by the, to the United States by the United States government, I guess, and they are in quarantine for days. It's one of the measures being taken to try to control this uh, to a pandemic. Um, if you do um, uh, 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 dimensional analysis of this equation, it helps simplify it for you. You look at uh, the numerators and denominators cancel each other out. And R naught is a dimensionless um, um, uh, um, value. It's a scalar with um, all the, the um, various units all become one when multiplied together. Um, the, um, Contact time, uh, that's a rate, and time of infection, um, that's an inverse rate, but uh, something per unit time is, is a rate. So sometimes people say basic reproduction rate, and that's the wrong term. R0 is a, is a, is a scalar that uh, has that factored in. Anyway, that's an important concept. So it's a number of secondary cases, one infection would av on average uh, create. And, it's, and it assumes kind of free 
mingling in a group. Yeah, R naught of two uh, would suggest uh, like one person's going to infect two people. Now let's look at measles. How bad is measles? R naught 12 to 18. So uh, just a little side take home point. One child with measles on average will affect, will infect 12 to 18 other children. And thinking about the fact that one in 20 with measles end up with pneumonia, which is the number one cause of death in measles when it goes bad, three in a thousand and, and end up with respiratory or neurological complications. One in a thousand can get encephalitis or measles infecting their brain. That can result in um, growth delays, developmental delays, or um, mental handicap, um, intellectual handicap for the rest of their life. Um, and I have seen patients who had uh, permanent sensory neural hearing loss in both ears from having had measles. I've seen a lot of patients over the years uh, got less uh, with. Um, uh, use of mumps vaccine, but um, mumps uh, was long considered the number one cause of unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Um, that doesn't come back. That's hearing that's it's gone. Occurred to me, distemper is a measles like uh, virus in dogs. People, any decent pet owner would get a canine distemper shot. Uh, to help is their poor dog not to get sick with, you know, distemper. Um, so I think that would make sense. You know, how would it not make sense to have your children immunized? Um, I, I just hope people will think that through. Okay. This is my favorite uh, slide. I think it's my most important slide in the whole talk. I'm approaching the end. Uh, it's the R naught uh, values and um, case for fatality ratios are often discussed. CFR I just listed as deaths here. Uh, over 8,000 cases of SARS from beginning to end. SARS is not in existence now. It's cleared. The last known case was the 18th of May 2004. Um, and the 16th first index case. It's traced back to November of 2002. 8,000 cases, 8,000 plus occurred. Each person that got it had between it, it was various estimates, two to five uh, other people would get infected. So if the R naught is greater than one, that means that if you have an infection, you can go out and you can spread it and you're gonna more than replace yourself as part of the infected population. So it will increase the number of infections. So if it's if it's one or less, then it's generally not sufficient to cause pan pandemic. Does that make sense? It's almost like a zero birth rate. Everybody has one kid. That'd be that'd be about the same thing. Okay, MERS had a higher death rate. So for a smaller number of cases, so. That was in a way more virulent um, and uh, um, on the other hand, the R naught is pretty low. It's less than one, So, which was kind of a surprise. So it's not as infectious and the, a lot of the people that got it tended to be in the hospital. Uh, um, so, um, well, that's a good point. It's sort of like, uh, yeah, it's like, um, um, is it going to be exponential growth or um, any, if it's an exponential growth and it's, uh, the exponent is one or less, it's going to be, uh, it's going to involute or control itself. It's going to remain uh, the same um, or lessen. Finally, uh, estimates now, the, we've got um, number of cases, almost uh, 
probably have well over 20,000 cases. We just don't know it yet. But confirmed cases means that they've swabbed the nasopharynx or they've lavaged the uh, airways and they've uh, uh, to get a sample. Lavaging the airway uh, with bronchoscopy uh, is the best way to get sample. And uh, then they do um, a PCR test, reverse transcriptase and the PCR, um, and look for fragments of the uh, uh, virus and identify it. Um, normal flu, it would depend on the flu. Um, uh, generally, uh, most of the time, normal flu wouldn't have this high a death rate. It could be pretty contagious. Influenza is pretty contagious. If you look at the Spanish flu uh, as a contrast to these, uh, the R naught of uh, Spanish flu of 1918, which can be estimated pretty well at this point because we have a lot of information about it, uh, was 2.5 or less, I don't know, something in that interval there, 1.4 to 2.8. Uh, but one in three uh, people on the planet, roughly, got this uh, uh, infection and um, uh, 50 million people died. This is worldwide in Spanish flu, if that's what you're referring to. So how to deal with it? Uh, the CDC, or Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, uh, recommends if healthcare workers use uh, washing hands, mask, gloves. Uh, I would recommend uh, goggles in dealing with viruses too. I, I was lucky, I've been uh, exposed to tuberculosis uh, more than most people I know. Uh, and I never converted, I never got it. Uh, I got histoplasmosis from growing up on a farm, which is a fungal infection in the lung. Uh, but it's pretty um, limited. Uh, it doesn't cause the damage tuberculosis does. It's not contagious. Uh, but uh, um, I, I had patients who coughed in my face when I was trying to examine their throat and stuff like that and ended up having tuberculosis. Uh, so I was sort of lucky. Uh, but these masks, uh, they are N95 masks, meaning they're carefully, they, they'll filter out 95% of the particles down to 0.3 microns. But again, uh, that's 300 nanometers. And the um, uh, coronavirus is about 125 nanometers. Uh, the idea is that the uh, um, uh, uh, coronavirus is not a Viron particle on average, but would still be in a glob of material that's just kind of suspended in the air. So wearing a high filtration mask like that is uh, generally thought to be effective and uh, it's pretty uh, reassuring. If you've ever worn one, they're very uncomfortable. It's hard to breathe through. You feel like uh, feel like somebody's put their hand over your mouth and nose and um, maybe pushing a pillow down on it or something. <laughs> it's like, I didn't I didn't like having them on, but um, I didn't like the alternatives either. So I, I, I cooperated, certainly. Um, uh, washing hands, washing hands, washing hands. Uh, suds, sudsy water. Uh, disrupts these viruses, and these coronaviruses particularly are in, uh, they have an envelope which is a uh, high lipid uh, content, and soap emulsifies lipids. So it disrupts the envelope. It also will disrupt the spike protein that uh, is the key to getting in the host cells. So um, wash your hands. This is, uh, I just thought this was cool and you can look at it if you want to look at the PDR. Um, this was, uh, reminded me of old models of uh, the uh, tracheal bronchial tree, which were made with wood's metal. This is a tectic uh, alloy, meaning its melting point was decreased. Eutectic alloys, they have a lowered melt. And uh, 
it use all these uh, elements combined. Um, I'm sort of surprised gallium wasn't used because uh, that's got a low melting point um, in alloy. Um, but at any rate, um, that kind of model resulted in a faulty, uh, um, uh, or the, the 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 interpretation of this of this kind of a, a model and resulted in a faulty uh, uh, concept for uh, the alveolar uh, spaces. Um, so you have two lungs, three lobes on the right, two on the left, and you have your trachea, carina at the bottom of that, and then kind of diverting off obliquely uh, is the left main stem bronchus and then the right main stem bronchus. Those are the primary bronchi. Uh, foreign bodies and aspirates like uh, chemicals or uh, uh, um, acid from the stomach, if you uh, happen to aspirate um, GI contents, uh, like happened to Jimi Hendrix. Uh, they, uh, before they took him to Guy's Hospital, he had aspirated his uh, vomit. It will burn the lungs. It'll cause us wipe out pneumonitis. But these, um, I don't know if you can trace it out here uh, on the on the on what's the left to you is right for the patient. This trachea is turned with the front part toward you, and the larynx is at the top there, like a like a. Um, 1700s or 18th century hat. Um, but you look on the left, um, patient's left, um, you'll see two main branches and uh, on the right you'll see three. Those lead to bronchopulmonary segments. I used to do bronchoscopy for cancer. Uh, and if we found some, we needed to be able to describe exactly which bronchopulmonary segment. And that's pretty tricky when you Get down in there, and you're just seeing the tube. Uh, Got to really keep oriented. This way, I just threw in for again for the PDR. I I, I mentioned this morning I, I came old school with uh, embryology, followed by uh, anatomy, and my basic science training, and it made anatomy so much easier because you uh, could see how things had formed and the names and uh, um, if you want to really understand the uh, structure of the endodermal derivatives, uh, uh, the lining of the lung, the endodermal and mesodermal, uh, then you might want to look at this uh, uh, slide in the PDF. Uh, and it has three links here for really nice short explanations. I wish that I'd had access to stuff like that when I was studying embryology. Just read books uh, until got it. And that kind of technical reading, meaning uh, reading it repeatedly and thinking and reading it again, going back and rechecking and such. Anyway, it's incredible how information is so much easier now. Accessibility is Bronchopulmonary segments are the functional elements of uh, the lung. They lead to uh, specific um, uh, regions of uh, alveolar spaces. I threw this in because it's a nice little glossary. Surfactant's important. Surfactant is uh, uh, something that in small quantities will, if you have these alveolar spaces and the uh, airways, and they're lined by water, uh, then when you expand them, it's it's like uh, the water tension, is, uh, surface tension of the water is uh, the model's been you're you're dealing with a bubble of water. Um, surfactants uh, um, tend to disrupt uh, the uh, um, high surface tension and makes it almost effortless to expand the lungs. The lungs na naturally tend to be unexpanded. They have a certain residual volume, but they have elastic recoil. If you get stabbed or shot. Uh, your lung will tend to collapse, and the space will fill up with air and then blood. Um, newborn, if they're stillborn, you take the lung and you put it in water. If it sinks, they've never got a breath. Uh, 
So it's uh, if it floats, they, they got a breath in. Um, at any rate, um, you expand the lung uh, by the diaphragm, uh, which is at the base. It's a dome and you have muscles in a kind of circumferential way. It pulls it down, expands the lungs, especially at the base. And so the models that were used to figure out lung physiology were not really accurate. This is a kind of a traditional model, but it, it shows these alveolar sacs and blood supply and such, but they are not grapes and they're not like bubbles. They're more like this, where there are little pores between alveolar spaces. And it's like a, a, a network of little septated um, spaces that you wander almost from any one place to a lot of places nearby. So it doesn't tend to collapse readily. It also has a, a, a mesh or a network of protective uh, tissue that holds it open. I thought I wanted to add this uh, 2000, so it was 2002, I was thinking it was 2003. Uh, Henry Prange at Indiana University uh, published this about arguing that um, the um, surfactant and Laplace's law applied to lungs uh, was overblown and not really accurate. And I had to agree. I, I thought it always bothered me in medical school. Um, I didn't have time to go work it out because um, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant and uh, you're not supposed to spill any. So there's no time to really go into things in the depth you'd like at times. But I, I, I found it satisfying to discover somebody had really dug into that and find uh, concepts of physiology on lung. Here's ARDS, where you start to get thickening of the septae. Remember the other one looks this, very defined and wide open spaces. And this not so much. This has all this fluid uh, material in the spaces and um, including blood cells. So there may be some bleeding into some of those spaces. That might be artifact, it's hard to know, but uh, that doesn't look so good. Okay, this is more from Franz. I'll let you look at that if you want to uh, in the PDF. This is a normal chest X-ray. Notice the diaphragm is at the bottom. There's a stomach bubble on the left on this, uh, look at the left side of this. Um, and uh, the heart shadow in the center uh, that tends to the right. And uh, which is one of the reasons the lung on the left has two lobes. It, I said it tends to the right, it tends to the left. Um, and the left lung has two lobes, the right lung has three lobes, and it has more space. Um, uh, you look down at the angles and you look at the bones and you can see the trachea. If you look at the top, you can see a tracheal shadow and you follow it down and uh, down uh, at the, about a finger breadth below where you have that oxbow of the clavicles, you can see it bifurcate. And so that's a normal lung. This one, not so much. This is an example of the change you start to see with uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome where uh, they're hard to ventilate and their lungs are tending to be collapsed and they require positive ex uh, end expiratory pressure or PEEP. In fact, normally people have about five uh, centimeters of PEEP because um, the upper airways will tend to collapse some, give uh, some resistance to uh, air egressing. Um, here's um, respiratory distress syndrome in an infant. And um, this one, like the one before, uh, if you look, you'll see all kinds of attachments. Uh, you can see an endotracheal tube up at the top in the trachea, and you can see a little tube that goes down into the stomach. Uh, that's a sick person in uh, intensive care. And uh, same, similarly for this one year, one day old, uh, sorry. Um, Wanted to mention hantavirus is kind of interesting and I don't want to get off on it, but uh, uh, and it occurs in the Andes and it, it, like rodent droppings, rodent excrement. Uh, hantavirus um, 
uh, can uh, uh, cause ARDS like a lot of insults. In fact, uh, this is what you see with this is a, is a young, healthy, uh, physically fit Navajo uh, gentleman was uh, developed a rapidly increasing shortness of breath and dyspnea and died from respiratory failure all because of exposure to this hantavirus that he probably contracted from nature. So I think vaping, vaping has a lot of risks. I'm not going to dwell on this because it's not the main topic, but you can look at it in a PDF. But it, uh, I thought it uh, kind of related to the ARDS part. I've talked a little bit about, you can look here on the, uh, to the right and you see the kidney as a capsule, um, a cortex, and these pyramidal medulla that drain into scalix and down the ureter, which is the white thing. Um, this, uh, these loops of uh, these tubules that get acute tubular necrosis are in those pyramids. Um, glomerular apparatus, uh, Bowman's capsule and the regular tufts, uh, they're in that cortex. Some are longer, some are shorter, but there's a Bowman's capsule in a glomerular tuft, uh, blood vessel tufts uh, uh, on the left, and there's the tubule um, dula part on the right in this one, just to show you what it looks like. And ATN, you get loss of definition, and the tubules have loss of their epithelial cells, and they can slough and form casts, and the uh, drainage becomes muddy. And so that's basically it. Um, the uh, We're going to have to see where this uh, new virus goes. And uh, um, the best weapon you have against it is fresh air and soap and water. I don't think you need to use bleach or uh, disinfectants with uh, anti bacterial agents, which can be pretty weird and you can absorb through your skin possibly. And uh, a lot of them have alcohol. Alcohol is not really a very good uh, thing for sterilizing things. It's a, it's, it's dissolved stuff. Now, one other point I made this morning, uh, there's two points I want to make yet real quick. One is that uh, viruses on a porous surface tend to die more readily. And it's thought because of the, um, porous nature of the surface it's on, it will draw away moisture, which disrupts the virus. Uh, a virus on formica or a doorknob, a smooth metal or a plastic toy may be uh, able to survive much longer. And there are people that do studies that find viruses uh, um, that appear in vivo, uh, um, in vitro rather, um, viable even five up to five days out. Now it's questionable to my thinking if they uh, would be still infectious for uh, in in the real world. Uh, but it, uh, I thought that was rather interesting. One other point I made I think is really really a big one, um, and I say this because there's crazy craziness anymore. Uh, the world needs uh, stable, good governments so that people can prosper and progress and uh, live in safety. And uh, you have people talking about no money except for defense, things like that. Or uh, do you know that uh, a bad pandemic can do more harm to a country than a war. It can take out um, the um, uh, a, a, a core of people of all ages right out of the center of a society and uh, in an untimely fashion. And uh, it can disrupt the economy and it could lead to ruin uh, and public health and things like what I like to say are three of the greatest achievements of the United States government, which are the creation of the National Institutes of Health and the Center for Disease Control, um, and the World Health Organization. And Europe has its um, uh, 
comparable organization now in China has uh, one that uh, that uh, has done a pretty remarkable job in being prompt and, and even building hospitals, new hospitals in two weeks because their uh, existing facilities were overwhelmed. Um, centralized authoritarian governments can do that. Uh, but there was some written about um, how um, the Wuhan um, food market was cleared out and disinfected uh, so quickly that specimens were not collected as well as they could have been and uh, evidence was lost to trace what had happened there. And it's sort of like handling uh, uh, the murder weapon, you know, with uh, before you get the fingerprints. But um, uh, as I said this morning, I don't want to criticize the Chinese government. I think that they've got a lot on their platter dealing with this and push them well. And uh, really, the whole world has to work together on this. And we require intelligent cooperation and respect uh, to be able to deal with this sort of thing. It's going to uh, has the potential for causing a lot of misery. So, any questions? Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chantal. Thanks, Sergey. I don't know about rates for um, emergence of viruses. These are sort of random, um, rare events, I think. Uh, but even though they are, there are so many uh, viral virons produced in any one infection. And um, the mutation rate is low. You know, in these 16 non-structural proteins in Coronavirus, coronavirus has a fairly stable genome, and it has a, a non-structural protein 14 actually has exon or X ribonuclease uh, uh, function, whereby uh, it has a couple of functions it can do uh, biochemically, but it actually um, is a de facto proofreader of the genome being transcribed. So there's careful regulation in the makeup of the coronavirus that it gets its replication of its RNA virus um, um, genome correctly, which is really amazing. <laughs> that uh, this is, uh, uh, the coronavirus is really an intricate and fascinating um, uh, array of, uh, of strategies. Um, it's pretty efficient because a lot of these uh, molecules combine in different ways and do different jobs with the same molecules. They don't have to have lots of separate genes. Um, so it's like 16 non-structural proteins and four structural proteins, sometimes five structural proteins. Uh, and 30, it's a, it's a large RNA genome, uh, 30,000. Um, uh, um, units of nucleotides. Um, and it's a single strand, uh, uh, well, I fear there's uh, going, uh, can we develop such viruses? You mean as a weapon or as a, I'm not sure what tool it would be. Uh, being able to um, develop delivery systems for, uh, um, DNA or chemotherapeutic agents or something like that to uh, attack specific cells would be cool. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, nature is uh, running its own experiment and we're, um, we're uh, either raiding it or we are the subjects of its uh, experiments. Uh, more than um, humans developing viruses. 
we can modify viruses, but uh, so far, like I don't think the CIA started AIDS and that sort of thing. I, it's <laughs> there's potential for lots of uh, conspiracy theories there. Any other questions? Thank you, Chantal. I appreciate everyone's interest and uh, attendance. Um, it's an honor to speak to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tata. Thanks, Chesley. It's hard for me to believe that um, governments are not storing viral material. For instance, uh, smallpox is still stored in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Russia, um, two sites in the world. Well, Southeast Asia is, um, uh, is, is has um, uh, rich biological diversity and uh, forests and uh, wildlife and, uh, and sort of like the Amazon has been a, a rich reservoir and um, the jungles of uh, Central Africa, uh, incredible uh, uh, reservoir of biological uh, mashups. Well, even even if there's hygiene in the markets, if you have an infected animal um, that uh, is being marketed, uh, that's still a danger to the public. And that's why I say public health is is uh, as important as uh, military defense. Maybe more so. Because in a, the, in the poorest countries that uh, they can arm themselves and go shoot at people easy uh, compared to uh, the cost and uh, uh, attention required to develop a healthcare delivery system that can head off a pandemic. Seems to me most anyone can pick up a gun and shoot it. That doesn't take much cleverness. Thank you for coming, Sergey. So any other comments or questions? Thank you, everyone. I'm going to turn off my microphone now. <laughs>